Okay, so good morning for some of us, but not all of us, I suppose. I just thought of that. Um, I guess the first thing we should note for the week is we have Wednesday off. Does everybody know we have Wednesday off? Yeah, Edward, we got Wednesday off for Cesar Chavez Day. Yeah, exactly. It's for Cesar Chavez Day. We got Wednesday off, so I'm not going to post videos on for Wednesday. I think that's unfair to ask you guys to watch videos, even though you have the uh, day off. So um, what we're going to do this week, which is mainly just today, is try to run through some material that will prepare us for next week. So today's going to be a little abstract, and I'm going to go a little quicker than normal, but that's because you have all week to come back at and look at this material if you need to see it again, um, since we have Wednesday off and I will not be posting videos because we have Wednesday off. Um, I will still have Friday office hours, so I'm happy to answer any questions you all have um, on Friday during office hours, like have I turned in my labs or did I do the labs correctly? That's a great uh, sort of set of questions you could ask in office hours. So before we dive into the four main bullet points we have for the day, I'm going to show you a few other things. OK, first off, from the syllabus, if you go to the first textbook that I recommend for this course, and then you go down to chapter three on expectation. Um, notice that's where we've been spending a lot of our time today, uh, this semester lately. And we're gonna continue to spend some more time in expectation. Today, we're gonna talk mostly about generating functions, section four. So if you want a good um, reference that goes in much more detail than mm. I will, but that might be beneficial for some, I encourage you to go to the syllabus's first textbook and find chapter three, section four. And specifically in section four, we are going to talk about moment generating functions. There are other generating functions. We will only need moment generating functions for um, what we'll be starting into next week. So again, today, this week, really, is just prep work for some mathematics we're gonna do next week. Okay, so the first one was where you can find some extra reading material. The second thing I'm gonna point you to before we get started for the day is this web page. It looks like I've stalled a little bit here. No, I haven't. You guys just don't see the same thing I see. OK, um, I don't know how to zoom in for you on this. So here's what I'll do. Um, if you go to github.com slash Raldi's slash Pluto notebooks, that's, the, um, that's me just typing out the URL that is above this, but I can't seem to increase the size of the font in the URL. So I've just typed out the URL here. So if you go to this um, website, this is very similar to how I host my uh, data sets in this class, which you've seen before when we've loaded data sets. Down here in the readme, whoops, sorry. Down here in the readme, I have links to three different distributions, two of which you've seen before, binomial and normal, and beta, which you've never seen before. We can mainly ignore that for a little bit. Later on in this class, we're going to be using this web page. Now, if you click this link, a bunch of fancy stuff like this is going to happen for almost a solid three minutes. It's taken me about a year and a half to find a set of free resources. Free is the key word here, absolutely free to you. Resources to host the kind of web pages I want. So uh, to benefit you all for learning. Just late last week, I have finally found a set of free resources to help uh, host the websites like I want to 
The problem is you have to wait three minutes, approximately three minutes, for the web page to be built. Uh, what's actually happening here with these little spinning wheels is like a whole new machine is being built for you. So the operating system is getting loaded on it. All the software I need is getting loaded on it. Um, and then a few other things are being installed and then it's going to create the web page and then it needs to host the web page and then it needs to create a URL for the web page and then it will load. So you do have to be patient if you're doing this. The GitHub links are not posted on my website, which is crazy now that I think about it. It totally should. I'll update my web page after class today to account for that. So for now, you'll have to go back to this video and hit pause and type in that URL. OK, so I'm going to come back to this web page later because I'm not going to just sit here with you all staring blankly at this spinning wheel for the next three minutes. But um, I'll show you what this web page looks like in a little bit, and then we will use it. And hopefully you all will start to use it uh, eventually after you're patient enough to wait for this entire server to be built for you. OK, so here we go. We're going to start with properties of the normal distribution. We haven't looked much at the normal distribution, even though it is probably the most common distribution used uh, around today. And there's good reason for it being the most common. I am going to justify why it's the most common distribution in the next two weeks, but it's going to involve a lot of math. So if the math becomes overwhelming, what I encourage you to focus on is the R code. Those are really your only two options at this point for the next two weeks. You can either focus on the high level math, which might become a little bit abstract, or you can focus on the implications of the math, which we will demonstrate in R code, um, but not until next week. So we're going to start with properties of the normal distribution to build up to some uh, cool results we're going to see next week. And then for the second half of today, we'll talk about moment generating functions. And that's um, also going to be a, bit, a little bit abstract. It's also going to build to some material that we will see next week um, that's going to have some big implications for us. And if you need some extra reading material on moment generating functions, you should go to section 3.4. That is chapter three, section four of the first textbook listed in the syllabus. Whew, that was a lot of prep work to get going today. Does anybody have any follow-up questions before I change slides? Oh, you know what I should do? Whoops. <laughs> okay, there is the link to the um, repository, to the GitHub repository that has like the normal and the beta and the binomial distribution links on it. So if you didn't get to copy down the URL from earlier, this should um, at least give you the link for now. And we're going to use the normal distribution today. I didn't hear any questions. We don't have too much time to wait around. So I'm moving on. If you've got follow up questions, please do interrupt me. Um, we're going to start with recall random variables. Random variables are the worst piece of notation I have ever seen the world of mathematics create. And yet, they're almost necessary. I have not figured out how to get rid of random variables uh, entirely. I really want to. So the best way to introduce random variables as we use them, not for what they really are, but as we use them, is remembering that the mean is the expectation of the identity function. So that is the mean looks like the expected value 
of the function we call the identity function, where ID of some value X is just that value X. Now, the, it's almost a benefit of random variables. The it's almost a benefit of random variables is with random variables, we can write the mean as the expected value of x. But notice this is very similar to as if we just took the right hand side of the identity function, made it capital and plugged it in to the expectation. This is as if we just took the right hand side of the identity function, made it a capital letter and then plugged it into the expectation. The only benefit of making it a capital X is to indicate visually that it is indeed a random variable and not some value. The only benefit to making it a capital letter is to indicate visually that it is indeed a random variable and not some specific value. So we should think of capital X, whoops, that's a terrible capital X, let's try again, capital X as representing the entire distribution for whatever distribution it is. Today, we're going to focus on normal distributions, but you could represent an entire distribution with a capital letter X, and it could be whatever. It could be binomial, it could be uh, Bernoulli, it could be normal, it could be gamma. The point is we should think of capital X as representing the entire distribution. So that is the whole curve, the whole density that looks like this. We should think of X as representing the entire density function. Right, so there was a direct message question that asked, so we should think of little X as a value? And that's correct. We should think of little X as a specific value. And we should think of capital X not as a set of values, but as a distribution, so a function that represents how likely these little values are to show up. I'm going to say that again. We should think of capital X as a distribution that is a function that represents how likely little values are to show up. The higher the density function, the more likely the values right in here in this uh, space are to show up. And the lower the density function out here in the tails, the less likely these little values are to show up. I didn't catch all of that. Do you want to say it again? Or was that a not talking to me? No, sorry about that. My sister's messing around. <laughs> hey, sister. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to then start exploring other benefits of random variables. Um, so we're gonna look at shifting and scaling normal distributions. And this is why I cannot get rid of random variables. 
let capital X follow or be distributed as normal 0, 1. So that means we have a normal distribution. And the mean is at 0. And the standard deviation is 1. So that's like something like the width at about the shoulders is 1. So if we go to that website that I pulled up earlier, it should be loaded by now, which is nice. And what I finally figured out how to create is a web page you can interact with hosted for free. And the idea is, look, here is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard and a variance of one. And just as a reminder, this tilde here, that means, means X, the random variable, follows or is distributed as a normal distribution with the following parameters. So the tilde here means the random variable on the left-hand side follows the distribution on the right-hand side. The tilde means the random variable on the left-hand side follows the distribution on the right-hand side. So what this web page allows you to do is to change mu and see, watch the x-axis down here, see how the values that are most likely change as the parameter mu changes. So as mu goes up to five, that means zero is not the most likely value anymore. In fact, five is now the more likely value. But Remembering that density is not probability. Five isn't the most likely value. Values near five are more likely than values near 10. Values near five are more likely than values near zero. So what we're hopefully seeing with this interactive web page is that as you shift the mean, the whole distribution just kind of shifts to wherever that mean is the whole distribution just kind of shifts to wherever that mean is. So you could go all the way down to like negative five. I don't know really what that represents, but theoretically, there is a new normal distribution with a mean now shifted down to negative five. And similarly, this web page allows you to shift or scale the distribution. When we adjust the variance, the kind of width of the distribution, we call it scaling. So we could go from a variance of one to something bigger. Now watch the x-axis values again. They will change as I shift, as I scale the variance up to let's say nine. Now a few things happened here. The distribution got shorter. The distribution had to get shorter because we made it wider. We scaled it wider by making the variance bigger. Now remember, all the area under a density function has to be equal to one. So if we're making the density wider, then it's gonna have to be shorter to compensate for the change in area under the density. Okay, so this web page should help us visualize Shifting and scaling of distributions. Shifting happens like this. If you take some constant, let's call it A, and add it to X, then you're going to get a new normal distribution centered at A with the same variance as before, so just one. And similarly, if you scale a distribution by some constant b, that is you take b times x, then you're going to get a new distribution centered at whatever it was before, because and this time I've only scaled, I have not shifted, with b as the new variance. And you can theoretically do both, as we just did on the web page, shifting and scaling together 
might look like this. Add A and scale by B. And that's exactly what this web page is supposed to indicate. You can shift by A to whatever values the web page lets you choose. So I'm going to shift by A equal to 1. So that's going to put the new mean, if I can work a mouse well enough, at 1. It's just to the right of 0. And I can shift by, oh, I don't know. In this case, I've shifted by um, 9 because now the variance down here is 9. And you could shift by any value really you want. And notice the distribution is getting wider and shorter. Let's find the next whole number we can. There we go, 36. Correct. We get that it's B for the variance, because it's just B times 1. So really, the way you should think about this is like, this is really just A plus 0 and 1. And this is really 0, B times 1. So down here, this is normal A plus 0 and B times 1. OK. Yep. And there's another question in the chat that says, if the variance was less than 1, would that make it skinnier and taller? And the answer is absolutely. I have not built that into the web page, though, because making the height of the distribution scale like that visually is difficult to do. But the intuition there is absolutely correct. If you had B for this value, whoops, sorry. If you had this value B as less than 1, it would shrink the distribution. It would make it skinnier and taller. OK, I told you we're moving quick, so I'm going to leave it there and move on to the next topic. But I hope that web page, which I will put a link up to on my um, website later on today, helps you understand the idea between shifting and scaling distributions. So let's let x1 and x2 be normal. Hmm. Let's write this out different. Let's let x1 be a normal distribution with some value mean mu1 and variance sigma1. And x2 will be centered at mu2 and have variance sigma squared 2. If you add x1 plus x2, now this is essentially like adding the entire distributions together. You shift them to mu1 plus mu2, and you scale them to sigma squared 1 plus sigma 2 squared as such. I don't have a great way to visualize that yet, but I hope you can extend the logic from shifting and scaling to the same idea of moving entire distributions around where the peak of the distribution is centered at mu1 or mu2. So if you just take these entire distributions and you add them together, you're just going to shift to a new spot and scale or squeeze appropriately. The normal distribution is one of the only distributions that this property works out this nicely with. I'll show you later on other distributions and why it doesn't work out as nicely. But for now, this is just a fact that we're going to need. 
for some way cooler results starting next week. Okay. Professor, I'm sure it's in the text, but can you provide a little motivation for why it's sigma squared as the variance? Oh, that's purely notational. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Christian, was that you? Yeah. Did I get that right? Christian, have you ever seen the argument between um, people who support pi as like the number of interest and people who support two pi? And they call it tau as the number yeah. of interest. I've certainly yeah, seen that. Yep. Same idea. It's the same debate in the world of statistics. Should we focus on sigma or sigma squared? Okay. It's purely notational. There's like no great rhyme or reason to why they went with sigma squared and not sigma itself. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. So I actually don't think you'll find that one in the book because most people just ignore it and just say, this is what we do. Do it. Okay, we've got like 25 minutes left of class to talk about moment generating functions. And this topic is unfortunately sizable in itself. So I'm gonna break this second half of class into topics itself. So the first topic for the second half of class is going to be just the definition of moment M generating G functions F. That will lead us into a definition of moments. It's just another expectation with a specific function G. That will lead us into the connection between one and two. And then we'll end with the moment generating function of IID. And I haven't explained what this is, but I will. Random variables. Okay. So let's say we have a random variable x that follows some distribution. It doesn't matter what that distribution is. The moment generating function of x is defined to be the expectation of e to the t x. And so we're actually defining a new function here. Let me, uh, sorry, I didn't give myself enough room. I should have thought for half a second before I started writing. We're actually defining a new function m, a function of t, that is the expectation of e times t to the power, uh, e to the power of t times x. And that is defining for us the moment generating function m. Okay, it's not obvious what this is used for, but that's what the rest of this class and next week are gonna do for us, is help us understand why we are generating this thing. I think some of the engineers may have seen functions like this before. This is basically like a Fourier transform, except we keep it to real numbers. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't have to. If it means something to engineers, rock on. So we're just gonna take this as our definition of a moment generating function. It's not obvious why it's named this because we don't actually know what moments are. So, Let's move on to topic two. Let 
Nice. Okay. Someone just said in, in the chat, they will get to Fourier transforms soon. And they're going to look a lot like you just saw, except um, it'll probably be written out as an integral or a sum only. And um, the expectation is meant to deal with both the integral or the sum, depending on whatever you're doing. Nice. You guys see it in physics too. That's cool. I haven't yet. Um, I imagine it can show up in fix physics, but I haven't learned enough physics to see what a moment space is. Harmon, I'd be interested to hear about that. Uh, I'm in a momentum space. <clears throat> okay, sorry, I'm going to move back on to um, statistics so we can get through all of this. Let x follow some distribution f. Then the kth moment is defined as the expected value of x to the k. And that's all there is to it. They just call these moments. For k equal to 1, they call it the first moment. We also know it as, also known as the mean. If you just go look back to the second slide of today's lecture, the expected value of x is just the random variable way to write the mean. There's just nothing special about these. They're just names of specific expectations. So what's really quite informative is why the moment generating function can generate these specific expectations. So we're going to go with connecting one and two. Let x be distributed f with mean that is expected value of x equal to mu. I'm just going to name it mu. I don't have a great letter here, and mu is a common choice in statistics. OK, you ready? <laughs> this is annoying notation, but this is what's going on. Here I am connecting moments with the mean. So I'm using the moment generating function to give me the mean mu. But the question is, why does this work? And so m prime is just fancy notation for a derivative. I see that's a question now. So this is really take the derivative of m with respect to t and then evaluate it at t equals to 0. And so let's try this. Derivative with respect to t of m of t evaluated at t equals to 0 should look like the derivative with respect to t of the expected value of e to the t times x evaluated at t equals to 0. OK, in the next step, I'm just going to start on a new page so I don't make this page too messy. And I'll just copy down what we had before. For the next step, I'm going to 
interchange the derivative and expectation. I'm not going to justify what allows us to swap these two because it's a little bit too technical as far as this class is concerned. There are some mathematical details behind switching integration, which is just the expectation and a derivative. I'm going to just walk over that. Theoretically, you have to do some mathematics to justify it. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, how about you all tell me, what's the derivative of e to the tx with respect to t? t times e to the tx. I assume you meant e to the power of tx? Yeah, and times. Times? Uh, x. X, where to go? Way to carry that chain rule forward. Okay, somebody else. What is that at t equals to zero? X. Woohoo. Okay, that was a bunch of really messy work to show that indeed the derivative of the moment generating function, the first derivative of the moment generating function evaluated at t equals to zero is just the mean written out with random variables. So that's a prime to say the first derivative. So the first derivative of the moment generating function evaluated at t equals to zero is just the expected value of the random variable itself. I understand at this point, all we have done is played with symbols and it's not exactly clear why this is important. I understand that. We've only got one day this week where I'm lecturing. So we're just gonna have to take all of this setup and then wait for a week holding our breaths till we can learn what cool things we can do with this material. For now, you're just gonna have to accept it that uh, here are some properties of moment generating functions. It doesn't seem super interesting or super applicable, but it turns out it really is. And we'll see that next week. Okay, I'm just going to keep pushing forward with these um, uh, properties of moment generating functions. Interrupt me if you have a question. So we can continue showing that the moment generating function by taking so many derivatives returns for us specific moments. And this one's not bad because we saw earlier that the first derivative of the moment generating function just looked like this. So can we use the first derivative of the moment generating function to justify why this top line is true? And all we really have to do is take the derivative of the first derivative of the moment generating function. But if you take the derivative of what's inside again, what's going to happen? Take the derivative with respect to t of this inside stuff. This x acts like a constant because we're taking the derivative with respect to t. x would just go to x squared, right? Perfect. So indeed, we have e to the tx times x squared evaluated at t equals to 0. And what do we get? x squared. Thank you. 
and I hope you all are starting to see the pattern that the more derivatives you take, the more powers on x you're going to get. And it's going to be one to one. For one derivative, you had x to the power of one. For two derivatives, you had x to the power of two. And they always evaluate at t equals to zero. So if we did enough of these, if you had the kth derivative of m evaluated at zero, you'd essentially just recover the kth moment of x. We go the opposite way and take the, ooh, I don't know. Okay, Hayes, that's an interesting question. I like the uh, connection in your head. If we take an integral of the moment generating function, would we get negative exponents? I don't think it's gonna work out that nice, but I don't have mathematical justification for it. All I have is intuition for it. you'd essentially end up with this. And the issue is when you take um, a derivative, I mean an integral, you're gonna have some leftover constant, right? You're gonna get something plus some constant. And that constant, is going to be unknown in this case because we don't have anything to give us a specific value. We don't have any constraints to give us a specific value. And that specific value will change the whole meaning of this integral, whatever value it is. So Hayes, I don't think it's going to work out as cleanly as you want to. I don't have like a, a rigorous way to show you that, but um, through imagining what's going to happen in the constant with that integral, uh, I don't think it's going to work out as nicely as you want it to. But that's about all I can say on it off the top of my head right now. Okay. Okay, we have seen a definition of independent before. We saw it in terms of probabilities, but if you recall, probabilities are just expectations. So we get things like this. Let x1 and x2 be independent. Then the expectation of x1 times x2 is equal to the expectation of x1 times the expectation of x2. We've seen similar sort of statements for probability. But if you recall, probability is just expectation with a specific function. So you get statements very similar like this. What's crazy is you also get statements like, uh, yeah, let's leave it out. Okay, so here's independence. It just says that two random variables have nothing in common. They don't share any information.
X1 and X2 are said to be identically distributed if they follow the same distribution. So that is if X1 tilde F and tilde is like follows the distribution named F or is distributed, excuse me, is distributed as F. And then if X1 and X2 follow the same distribution, then X2 also follows F. Okay, it's not super clear why we need that, but there is a really nice property that comes from it. So this is such a common property that they call it independent. That's what the first I is for and identically distributed. IID means independent and identically distributed. Whoops. <laughs> okay, adding independent and identically distributed random variables continued. Let y equal x1 plus x2. The moment generating function of y, and it now matters which M we're talking about. So I'm going to put a subscript capital Y on it to say this is the moment generating function of Y itself is the expectation of E to the T times X1 plus X2. I hope you don't mind. I've shortcutted one step in the name of time. X1 plus X2 is really just another name for Y. So really all I've done is put Y right here in terms of X1 and X2. Well, that based on properties of exponentiation is just X1 times T times E to the power of X T times X2. It might take you a minute to see that, but I think you can get it. We can break up the product right here inside because X1 and X2 are independent. And one last step. Just writing it out so we see where we left off. This is just e to the t x1 to the power of 2. Because x1 and x2 are identically distributed. And right at 1050, that is all I had for us today. I wasn't sure we were going to get it all in, but we did. These are all some tools we're going to need for next week since we have Wednesday off. And I'm not going to give you videos on Wednesday because that seems unfair when you have Wednesday off. So these are all tools we're going to need for next week so we can learn some really, really cool and very, really very applicable properties 
of statistics. These are tools we're going to need to learn some really applicable properties of statistics. I'm going to stop recording now. Thanks for your time today. I hope you guys have an enjoyable Wednesday.